Hi, friends. Happy New Year and welcome to the first sermon on the Daryl Johnson podcast in 2023. We hope that the Christmas season was meaningful for you and that you're starting this year with joy and peace in your heart. Before we begin, I do want to say a huge thank you to those of you who gave before year end. We were able to reach our goal of raising $50,000 as a part of our match. And because of your generosity, our team at the Canadian Church Leaders Network here can continue to serve the church, including through this podcast. There were so many people who gave, but to name a few, thank you, Kathy, Thomas, Mona, Joanne, Sue Young, Grant, Karen, Richard, and many, many others. We're so thankful for your participation in this work. Well, we are back in the series, Making Maturing Disciples of Christ, a series Daryl preached in 2013 at First Baptist Church. In today's sermon, Daryl preaches from the popular verse, Galatians 5, 16, which reads, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We hope that through this message, you are encouraged to embrace the power of the spirit in your life to overcome the flesh and form Christ in you. Now, before we jump in, I do want to thank our friends at the Canadian Bible Society who made this episode possible. We want to highlight one of CBS's resources called The Bible Course. It's a course that was created to help the average person engage with God's word in a deeper way. The Bible course includes eight weeks of video teaching that are all designed to connect the events, books, and characters of scripture together into one big story. If your group of friends or small group at church is looking to go deeper into scripture, consider moving through this course together. To check out the first video for free and to learn more about the course, just head to biblesociety.ca slash the Bible course, and you'll find all you need. That's biblesociety.ca slash the Bible course. Well, with all that said, let's jump in with Daryl. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Since the Sunday after Easter, we have been intentionally exploring what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We will continue intentionally doing so through Labor Day at the end of the summer. I say intentionally because, as I pointed out when we began this series, the exposition of any text of Holy Scripture inevitably ends up with Jesus in some way or another, and inevitably ends up working through the response to Jesus' call, come, follow me. So over the last few weeks, we've been realizing for the first time or the 20th time that there are many dimensions to discipleships. There are, there are many ways of understanding relationship with Jesus. There are many angles on what it means to follow him. That is, there are many different biblical texts that open up for us this unspeakable privilege Jesus is giving us. Recently, someone asked me, given the fact that there are so many biblical texts, can you suggest just one that I can major on that takes me to the very heart of discipleship? My answer was no. But I can suggest two that are most essential and take us to the heart of discipleship. One of them is from Jesus himself and the other is from the Apostle Paul, who I think learned what he says from Jesus. The one from Jesus himself is John 15. Surprised? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who abides in me and I in him or her bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Bottom line, stay connected to Jesus. Stay plugged into Jesus. Jesus chooses to live in his disciples, so live in him. The other text is the one I invite you to join me in this morning. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians, Galatians 5.16, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. I think this is the Apostle Paul's fundamental discipleship text. For Paul, it all comes down to this, walk by the Spirit and you will not 
carry out the desires of the flesh. I think Paul is saying that we abide in Jesus by walking in the Spirit. Now, I have known Jesus for 62 years now, since I was three and a half years old. And I've been seeking to intentionally follow him for 46 years now, since my third year in university. And over the years, God has provided for me mentors, coaches, who help me understand the way of Jesus. And I'm profoundly grateful for them. They've helped me get to the stage of maturity that I do, in fact, enjoy. But I wish I had had a mentor who would help me live in Galatians 5.16. I have had to do this all on my own. Had I had someone early in the journey who had invested in me to help me understand the practicalities of Galatians 5.16, I would be much more mature than I am today. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. One command and a wonderfully liberating promise. Not two commands, as one version of the Bible wrongly interprets this, wrongly translates it. It translates it, walk by the Spirit and do not carry out the desires of the flesh. No, no, no. Not two commands. One command. And a wonderfully liberating promise. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now, as you know, whenever you're going to focus on just one verse of Holy Scripture, you need to do so in context. So, I invite you now to open your Bibles to Paul's letter to the Galatians. We're going to read from chapter 3, 5, and 6. If you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Begin at chapter, one, chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians. <laughs> well, what a way to start a text. Who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of law? Or did you receive the Spirit by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Then chapter 5, verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Then chapter 6 verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Living God, we believe that you enabled the Apostle Paul to think in these deep, deep ways. And we believe that you enabled him to write down what you taught him faithfully. And I pray now in your mercy and grace that you would help us live into the reality of these words as never before, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Through the words of his apostle, Jesus is calling us into a new life and a new way to live it. Again, I want to emphasize one command, not two 
The text does not say, walk by the Spirit and do not carry out the desires of the flesh, which is actually the way most of us read it. Wrong. One command, live by the Spirit and a life-giving promise, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Paul here employs a grammatical construction, which in the Greek language is the strongest way of negating a future possibility. For those of you studying Greek, it is ou, me, plus the error subjunctive. Walk by the Spirit and you will not. You will not. You will not. You will not. There's no way to really get this out in English. Walk by the Spirit and you will not. You will not. You will not. You will not. You will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Oh, how I want to live the reality of that text. Please, Jesus. Now, before we seek to understand what Paul is getting at, I want you to notice something about this one sentence that is not the case with other texts of Scripture. What I want you to notice is that you can rearrange the key terms of this sentence and end up with other equally true statements. The way it reads is, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. But you can also say it correctly, walk by the flesh and you will not carry out the desires of the Spirit. You can also say, walk by the flesh and you will carry out the desires of the flesh. And you can say, walk by the Spirit and you will carry out the desires of the Spirit. Pretty cool, eh? Should I say that again? Walk by the Spirit. And you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Walk by the flesh and you will not carry out the desires of the spirit. Walk by the flesh and you will carry out the desires of the flesh. Walk by the spirit and glory, 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 you will carry out the desires of the spirit. So let us try to seek to understand Paul's terms here, flesh and spirit. That's my major agenda for this morning. Just understand these terms. What is the apostle of Jesus getting at? How is he using them in this, what I think to be the fundamental discipleship text? Flesh. Uh, The Greek word is sarx. It can refer to bodily existence, as in the phrase flesh and blood. And this is how Paul actually uses it earlier in his letter in Galatians 2.20, which I understand to be the life text for many of you. The life I now live in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God. Now, their flesh clearly refers to concrete earthly existence, materiality. But in Galatians 5.16 and in the companion text in Romans 8, Paul is using the term theologically. Flesh is Paul's shorthand way of describing the human condition apart from grace. Flesh is human existence as it has come to be in light of the fall of humanity, in light of sin. Flesh is the sphere of existence where the ego wants to be number one, uro numo. Flesh is the sphere in which the ego resists and even rebels against the living God. Flesh is Paul's shorthand way of describing the human condition apart from God. Now, this is why Martin Luther renders the term flesh... The self turned in on itself. Awful phrase. The self turned in on itself. That's flesh. Spirit. Uh, In Greek, it's the word pneuma. comes into the English language in words like pneumatic. Spirit does often in Scripture refer to the deepest recesses of our being, almost synonymous with soul. And this is how Jesus uses the word when he speaks to sleepy disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But from the whole context of Galatians, I think it's clear that spirit in Galatians 5.16 refers to the spirit of God, to the Holy Spirit, to the third person of the Trinity, to the very breath and life of God. Earlier in the letter, in Galatians 4, 4 to 7, Paul speaks of God's twofold sending. God sends his Son into the world as Savior, and then God sends his Spirit into the hearts of his disciple, of disciples of the Son in the world. Walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Holy Spirit. Walk by the very life of God, and you will not, you will not, you will not 
carry out the desires of the self turned in on itself. Okay, I want to press this deeper. Let me try to unpack these key terms Paul is using for us. What does he mean by flesh and spirit? I'm going to go a little deeper. Flesh. Life in the flesh can be characterized by five propositions. I'm going to say in a moment that life in the spirit can also be characterized by five propositions. Okay? So life in the flesh, five propositions. First, life in the flesh is lived in the body. It's lived in material existence in the stuffness of creation. Two, life in the flesh is centered in and around the self, the ego. The most frequently used words in the vocabulary of the flesh are I, me, mine, myself. Third, life in the flesh is therefore self-oriented, me first, self-directed, my vision, Self-governed, I did it my way, no one is going to tell me how to run my life. And self-empowered, give us enough time and enough technology and we will repair the world. Self-oriented, self-directed, self-governed, self-empowered. Fourth, the goal of life in the flesh is to build up one's own reputation and kingdom. To establish and maintain one's own name and rule. And fifth, the basic drive of life in the flesh is control. Bingo. Since I am the center, and since I'm the master of my own life, and since it is all up to me, I have to control life around me. The basic drive of flesh is to put other people in nice, neat boxes where we can control them. And if the flesh ever thinks about God, it puts God in a box in order to control God. Now, it's very important to realize and to emphasize that flesh can wear religious clothing. In fact, I submit to you, that most religion is fundamentally flesh. Most religion is the human effort to placate God and to get God to fulfill our own egotistical needs and ends. The flesh can talk God talk. It's just that the God it talks about is the God created in its own image, who strangely endorses and and walks to our agenda. The flesh can even come up with religious cliches, like, God helps those who help themselves. Fleshly. Or, look inside to the God who is in you, who is you. Etc. In some countries, as you might know, the flesh will even print on its currency the words, In God We Trust. But everyone knows what those words mean. It means in the currency we trust. In our wisdom and in our power we trust. The fact of the matter is, you cannot even talk about God in the place where the currency is minted. Flesh. Yuck. Spirit. Life in the Spirit, life in the Spirit of God can also be characterized by five propositions in contrast and comparison with the propositions about life in the flesh. So, first, life in the spirit is also lived in the body, in the material world. And this is critical to grasp. Life in the spirit, life in the transcendent spirit of God is very earthy life. Not earthly, but earthy life. It's all part of God's great intention in creation and incarnation. The very life of God who hovered over the deep and breathed into being this wonderful world. The very life of God who dwelt in and animated the body of Jesus of Nazareth now comes to dwell in our bodies, in this material stuffness. Do you not know that your bodies, Paul asked the Corinthians, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? You're looking at a temple right now. And I'm looking at all these temples. 
The Holy Spirit comes to take up residence in our bodies. The Spirit does not take us out of or beyond the space-time material existence for which we are created. Walking in the Spirit, whatever else it means, is not opposed to eating and drinking and enjoying creation. It's not opposed to laughing and playing and making love. Indeed, it's the presence and power of the Spirit that enhances those aspects of our earthly existence. Life in the spirit, like life in the flesh, is lived in the body, the tangible, measurable, visible bodies. Now, this is why in Romans, Paul exhorts us, present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is where spirituality is going to be lived out, in our bodies. In fact, we'll discover next week that you cannot do any of the spiritual disciplines without your body. The New Testament knows nothing about disembodied spirituality. It all involves the body. Life in the spirit is in the body. But, second, in contrast to life in the flesh, life in the spirit is centered in and around the living God. There has been a shift in center, a huge shift. There's been a kind of Copernican revolution. The ego has been taken out of the center and the triune God has come into the center. Blessed be his name. Third, therefore, this life is God-oriented, your name be hallowed. God-governed, your kingdom come. God-directed, your will be done. And God-empowered, we we cannot, but you can. God-oriented, God-governed, God-directed, God-empowered. Fourth, in contrast to life in the flesh, the goal of life in the spirit is God's reputation and kingdom, the enhancement of God's fame and reign. And fifth, in contrast to life in the flesh, life in the spirit is not driven to control. Since I am not the center, since it is not all up to me, since I'm not the master, then I can let go of control and rest in the control of the God who loves me. Oh, 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 is it really possible to live such a life? Now, we can appreciate why then in Galatians 5.17, Paul goes on to say that the flesh and the spirit are in opposition to one another. The flesh is so egocentric It actually is hostile toward God, Romans 8, 7. The flesh perceives God as a threat. So determined is the flesh to live for itself, so determined is the flesh to assert its own independence, that God is, the flesh finally hates God. Isn't that what we're witnessing in our time right now? Just beneath the surface of this uh, tolerance, just beneath the surface of this graciousness in our country, just beneath the surface is this hostility to the living God. Why? Because the living God, the living God, is in fact one who exposes the illusion by which we are living. The living God exposes the lie that we are the captain and we are in control. So Paul says, the flesh hates the spirit. And, and this is really critical to get for discipleship, the spirit stands against the flesh. Oh, that's putting it mildly. The spirit is out to end the flesh. The Holy Spirit invades us to burn away all that is unholy. The flesh and the Spirit are in opposition to one another and the Spirit will not settle for any compromise arrangement. Boy, this is good news. This is good news. Initially, it might not be good news. Initially, it could feel very offensive and very frightening. But one day, that text is going to become something we rejoice in. The flesh fights the spirit, and the spirit fights the flesh. Oh, precious spirit, win the battle for my soul. I will, he says, I will. Now, as you can expect, these radically different ways of living, flesh and spirit, will result in radically different qualities of life. 
Each way of living, flesh, spirit, is going to give birth to a whole different set of attitudes and behaviors and values and lifestyles. So, the quality of life produced by the flesh is what Paul calls the deeds of the flesh. I hate this list. I never like reading it out loud. It is so offensive to our postmodern sensibilities, but it's documented all over the globe. Paul does not mince words here. He just comes right out there, offensive though it may be, and he says, here's what walking by the flesh is going to lead to. Here's the natural outcome of self at the center, self Grounded, self-governed, self-empowered living. Uh, Paul's list is not exhausted. He says things like these, meaning that he's simply illustrating the kinds of things that emerge from living by the flesh. A number of years ago, while our oldest son was still in high school, we were reading this text at breakfast, and, and David said, after reading the list about the deeds of the flesh, boy, Dad, that is really chaotic. I thought, what a good observation. Good on you. Later that day, I pulled out a commentary by Otto Bett, who wrote, This seemingly chaotic arrangement of these terms is reflective of the chaotic nature of sin. And this chaos is to be con- contrasted with the oneness of the fruit of the Spirit in its orderly arrangement. Paul says that these deeds of the flesh are evident. They're visible for all to see. And he says they're evident in the full range of our existence, in our sexuality, in our spirituality, in our relationships, and in society. So just for a moment, look at the list again. In our sexuality, the flesh issues in immorality or fornication, sexual intercourse outside the one man, one woman covenant of marriage. It issues in impurity, unnatural sexual behavior, and it issues in sensuality, open and reckless abandon of decency. In our spirituality, the flesh refers issues into idolatry, creating gods in our own image and trusting other than the living God. It issues in sorcery, the secret tampering of the powers of evil. Interesting, the Greek word there is pharmakia, which comes into our language as pharmacy. In Paul's day, pharmakia referred to drugs used to alter one's state of consciousness. Nothing new under the sun. In our personal relationships, the flesh issues in enmities, strife, contentiousness, jealousy, outbursts of anger, fits of rage, disputes, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envying. And then in larger society, flesh issues in drunkenness and carousing, orgies and drunken bouts and all the wreckage that comes with it. That, according to Paul, is the natural consequence of opting for life in the flesh. And according to Paul, and I think the rest of Scripture, it's the only form of life that can result from the flesh. Which is why the only hope for human societies in any age is a spiritual revolution, a fresh moving of the Spirit of God. Reform movements that are driven by the flesh, however good they are, Reform movements driven by the flesh do not ultimately bring about lasting transformation. And that's because flesh only begets flesh. Do not be deceived, Paul says in Galatians 6, 8. God is not mocked. (laughs) What we sow, we reap. Sow to the flesh and you're going to reap a society of corruption and deterioration. Slow to the spirit so to the Spirit, and you're going to reap a society full of eternal life. Now, Paul adds a solemn warning here. It's Galatians 5.21. I warn you as I forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he's not saying here that if you discover some deed of the flesh in your soul that somehow uh, you're out. And he's not saying that, that we have to be perfect to inherit this kingdom of his grace. No, I think he's saying that if that list, the deeds of the flesh, describes our overall long-term lifestyle, then we're in trouble. We're under the rule of flesh. It means the kingdom of God is not yet broken in. 
Yuck. The quality of life produced by the Spirit stands in marked and refreshing contrast. It's what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit, which Brent had us recite earlier. He calls it fruit to emphasize the fact that we do not produce it. I'm going to say that again. It's fruit because we do not produce it. It's not our doing. Paul is echoing Jesus' words in John 15, that it's because we abide in him and Jesus' life is in us that this fruit comes forth. He uses the singular because you cannot separate out these different qualities. They come together in a package. They come together in a cluster. And what a delicious cluster it is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, the reason why this cluster is so delicious is that it is a description of Jesus the most delicious person who ever lived. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is not just any kind of love. It's Jesus' love. The fruit of the Spirit is not just any kind of joy. It's Jesus' joy. The fruit of the Spirit is not just any kind of patience. It's Jesus' patience. It's not just any kind of gentleness. It's Jesus' gentleness. And it's not just any kind of self-control. It's Jesus' self-control. The Spirit of Jesus indwells the disciples of Jesus fighting against the self turned in on itself, causing the very character traits of Jesus to spring up. So, so look at the text again. Look at the list again one more time, more carefully. Paul is saying that it is the Spirit's desire to reproduce in us the virtues which marked Jesus' earthly life. Love. Jesus' sacrificial, unconditional caring for people. Joy, Jesus' delight in his Father in even crummy circumstances. Peace, Jesus' inner tranquility, born of his confidence that there was nowhere he would go out of the grip of his Father. Paul says, the Spirit also desires to reproduce in us the attitudes Jesus had to other people. Patience, (laughs) Jesus' ability to endure troubled people in troubling circumstances. Kindness, Jesus' tender concern that gave birth to generosity. Jesus' goodness, his integrity, his honesty, his justice. And, and, this is the thing that excites me the most. Paul says that the Spirit desires to reproduce in us Jesus' own inner maturity. Faithfulness. Jesus' confidence in his Father and Jesus keeping his own word. Gentleness, Jesus' inner freedom from the need to retaliate or to hurt people who hurt him. And self-control, Jesus' mastery over the tongue and his mastery of human drives and desires. What a wonderfully delicious cluster. Notice that Paul says, against such things there is no law. Galatians 5.23, against the fruit of the Spirit there is no law. Uh, What's Paul getting at here? My father made his living as a nuclear physicist, having spent most of his career caught up in that fear-driven frenzy of the Cold War. In the early 1990s, when the tensions between the superpowers were beginning to thaw, and when the West was now opened up to the People's Republic of China, my dad had the privilege of traveling to China as a member of the team of Western physicists, to meet in Beijing at the University of Peking with a team of Chinese physicists. And during those visits, he met a Dr. Fung, who became one of my dad's most precious friends. At the first meeting there at the University of Peking, Dr. Fung noticed the life of Jesus in my dad, and so during the break, snuck up to him and quietly said, I too am a lover of Jesus. And during those years of their friendship, Dr. Fung wrote an essay on love. He tries to understand love as a physicist and then he tries to understand love as a disciple of Jesus. And he says he did not come to understand love until he experienced the love of Jesus for him, a sinner. I have a copy of this essay. It's one of my most prized possessions. Now, Dr. Fung especially liked Paul's letter to the Galatians and especially this text we're looking at this morning. (laughs) And here's the reason he loved the text. Because of the phrase, against such things there is no law. 
Dr. Fung took Paul to mean that no one could make a law that would keep him from living the fruit of the Spirit. You see, he had been in prison many times during the Cultural Revolution, wherein all kinds of laws were made against all kinds of things. But he would say, there's no law that can keep me from loving. I can still see his face when I got to meet him in his Mao uniform, broken teeth, delight on his face. He says, there's no law that can be made to keep me from loving. No law against him loving his fellow prisoners or loving the guards who hurt him. No law could be made against experiencing the joy of the Lord in his prison cell. No law could be made against him from experiencing peace in tough circumstances. No law could be made against him for practicing patience and kindness and gentleness. And no law could be made against him for exercising self-control instead of wanting to lash out at those who were trying to hurt him. Wow. Why? Because from deep within the wellsprings of our being, the mighty, free, sovereign Spirit of God overcomes the flesh and brings forth the character of Jesus in us. The question is, what part do we play in this? If this delicious cluster is really the work of the Holy Spirit, do we even have a part? Yes, we do. Walk. An active verb. Walk in the Spirit, a very active discipline. So how? How do we walk in the Spirit so that we do not carry out the desires of the flesh and so that we carry out the desires of the Spirit? We'll tackle that question next Sunday. But for now, let me say this much. Walking by the Spirit involves much intentionality. This is where the rubber meets the road in discipleship. Much intentionality. It involves intentionally adopting proper posture. A proper posture toward the flesh on the one hand and a proper posture toward the Spirit on the other hand. The proper posture toward the flesh? Crucifixion. Death. Galatians 5.24 Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its desires and passions. We have like, Paul, when did that take place? And the proper posture toward the Spirit? Surrender. Galatians 5.18 If you are led by the Spirit, we cannot be led without surrendering. We cannot be led without laying down the, ro- the, the reins. We cannot be led without setting aside control. We cannot be led without welcoming the Spirit to come and overcome the flesh and reproduce the life of Jesus in us. Next week, we'll try to unpack that. For today, I think that what we're supposed to do, I think we're supposed to just sit for a few moments in silence and look at those different lists. And as you do, surrender to whatever degree you know how, ask the Holy Spirit to root out any deed of the flesh you see in your soul and ask the Holy Spirit to go deeper and fulfill His great desire that we look like Jesus, that we actually act like Him. Be still before him. Hi, friends. I trust you were encouraged by the message that you just heard, that you were able to understand the Word of God a little bit better, and that you came to know and love Jesus a little bit more. I mean, that's the point of all these messages when all is said and done. If you'd like more resources like this, more notes, 
Uh, some of the books I've written, which are actually uh, containing the sermons that I've done, you can find that information at the website that my friends have made, daryljohnson.ca. God bless.